very good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you who have joined us for this virtual international launch of the new Migration and Food Security or My Food Partnership Grant Project. Uh, our participants today span over 15 hours of time zones from British Columbia on the west coast of Canada to Nanjing in China uh, in the east. My name is Jonathan Crush, and I'd like to extend a particularly warm welcome to a sunny but chilly Waterloo, to all of the participants in this project from our partner organizations scattered around the globe, our funders, Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, and to everyone else who's logged on to find out more about a new initiative that we hope will fundamentally reshape our understanding of the nexus between migration and food security in the next few years. First, a quick word about the program for those who haven't had the opportunity to consult it. I'll shortly introduce our two main speakers for the opening session, and then we'll move on to a brief overview of the context, aims, and objectives of the My Food Project. We'll then hand over to our panel of prominent international experts who reflect on the issues which the project seeks to address from different institutional, thematic, and disciplinary perspectives. And the panel will conclude with a short Q&A. We'll then move to wrap up with some concluding reflections, and we hope that you'll stay with us for the next hour. So let me move quickly to get the program underway by introducing our two speakers who will offer some words of welcome. Uh, first, we'll hear from Dr. Anne Fitzgerald, who's the director of the Bolsilly School of International Affairs. Uh, the school is hosting the My Food Project and has generously provided space and facilities for the project secretariat. Then I'll ask Jonathan, Dr. Jonathan Newman to say a few words on behalf of Wilfrid Laurier University, the lead Canadian university in the new project, where he is the vice president of research. And in this context, I'd like to express our collective and sincere thanks to both Jonathan and Anne and their staff for all of the great support they gave to us as we moved from initial project concept and planning workshop in November 2019 here in Waterloo to stage one application in February 2020 to stage two in October 2020 and finally to the successful outcome in what is always a highly competitive interdisciplinary grant competition funded by the SSHRC. So without further ado, over to you, Anne. Thank you so much, Jonathan. I hope everybody can hear me. Um, on behalf of the Balsillie School of International Affairs, good morning, afternoon, and evening to wherever you may be. And this by far, I think, has um, uh, this event has uh, spanned the widest number of uh, time zones, I think, uh, in the Balsillie Schools event for a long time. My name is Anne Fitzgerald. I'm the director of the Balsillie School of International Affairs. I'm also a professor of international security in Wilfrid Laurier University's Department of Political Science. It's my distinct pleasure and privilege to participate and help to open this official launch of the My Food Partnership grant project. It's an exceedingly important research project which falls squarely within the broader work of the Balsillie School's Migration, Mobilities and Social Politics Research Cluster. And also, of course, the broader research program led by Professor Jonathan Crush and his Hungry Cities partnership team and the broader global network um, that is involved in this work. Uh, many representatives from which are here today. Before I continue, I would like to start with a land acknowledgement. For those in the audience tuning in from outside of Canada, one of the actions we take to advance reconciliation between settler and Indigenous peoples is to reflect on our relationship with the land and on the continuous process of colonization that deeply impacts our work. Acknowledging this land is uh, an is, is a process of deliberately naming that this is Indigenous land and that Indigenous people have rights to this land. The Balsillie School of International Affairs is situated on the Haldeman Track, the land promised to the Six Nations that includes six miles on either side of the Grand River, which is on the traditional territory of the Atawandaran, the Anishinaabe, 
and the Haudenosaunee peoples. We are thrilled and delighted to welcome such a broad range of renowned experts today on intersectional issues concerning migration, mobilities, and food insecurity. It is a subject that the wider research community here in Waterloo shares a committed interest to, and indeed uh, an area that plays a significant role in uh, Wilfrid Laurier University's broader research strategy and the interdisciplinary perspectives that the Balsillie School brings together under Jonathan's lead on this issue. As some of you may be aware, the Balsillie School of International Affairs is part of a collaborative research arrangement with three other partners. Those partners include University of Waterloo, Wilfrid Laurier University, and the Center for International Governance Innovation, a, a policy think tank which is co-located with the Balsili School in our wonderful building. We are based in the center of Waterloo, Ontario, Canada, and I like to describe this, um, uh, uh, this footprint that we occupy as being at the heart of the intellectual square mile of a city in Canada that is reputable for innovation, technology, and interdisciplinary perspectives on governance. As such, the Balsili School is fortunate to bring together constellations of leading researchers, both from the social sciences and humanities, and also from the material, physical, and natural sciences to develop interdisciplinary thinking on critical challenges to humanity. Although the Balsili School has pursued a, a very cautious return to our building strategy and to our campus, we made a decision in September of this year to, until the winter term sets in, maintain virtual events only. Having said this, we look forward to hosting you all here in our wonderful building very soon and wish you the very best for this important event and the interesting discussions that will no doubt flow from the event and shape and inform the project's journey. So thank you very much. Um, I'd like to pass the baton now over to Wilfrid Laurier University's Vice President for Research, Jonathan Newman. Thank you, Anne. <clears throat> and thank you, Jonathan, for the kind invitation to help you celebrate this wonderful achievement. It's my distinct pleasure on behalf of Wilfrid Laurier University to welcome you all. Looking at the chat, it's really, really lovely to see guests from around the world. Thank you for joining us outside of your, what are I'm sure outside of your regular working hours. I wish we could have done this in person, but in a way Zoom makes this a much more inclusive event than it would have been had we done it in person. Nevertheless, perhaps we will all be together for a celebration of the end of the project. I won't presume to lecture this audience on the moral imperative that we have to ensure that all people enjoy food security. You all know the challenges far better than I do, um, but I would like to think that solving these challenges is not beyond the wit of humans. And I am hopeful that the work of my food partnership uh, will help us move to a world where the most vulnerable amongst us can experience a better life. The English novelist, Mary Ann Evans once remarked, what do we live for if not to make the world less difficult for each other? Jonathan and the My Food team have a chance to do this, and you all can be rightfully proud of your contributions to such a noble goal. You didn't come here to listen to me, um, but rather to this rather distinguished panel of experts. And so I'll close by just congratulating Jonathan and the team. This is a truly wonderful accomplishment, but now the really hard work begins, and I know you're up to the task. I, I'm really looking forward to the, today's discussion. I wish you all a happy holiday season and I hope you have a happy and healthy new year in a safe and peaceful world. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much, uh, John. Over to you, Bruce. All right, good day. I'll just say good day, given that we're all spread out across the world. So good day to you all and a warm welcome. I'm Bruce Frain, and uh, I'm a professor over in the, uh, the University of Waterloo, and um, have been part of the Hungry Cities Partnership for a long time. And so um, 
just very briefly, I want to just take you back 30 years to a visit that I got from Jonathan Crush uh, at the University of Namibia. This is in the early 1990s. And Jonathan at that time was getting the Southern African migration project as it was underway and invited Namibia to be a partner in that. And that was the beginning of the first network focused on migration in Southern Africa. And that became the Southern African Migration Program, which is still alive and well today. Little did we know though, that there would be several other networks built on that foundation that would take us 30 years into the future. And that's where we are today. So based on the work of the Southern African Migra Migration Program uh, in Namibia specifically, we realized that migration was a fundamental piece of the food security puzzle. And in fact, the urban food security puzzle. We pitched this to the IDRC, International Development Research Center of Canada. And they gave us some, some funding and said, get together with some people from your network in Southern Africa and figure out whether you want to do further work on the relationship between migration and urban food security. Long story short, we ended up in the end with the African Food Security Urban Network. And we undertook baseline household food security survey work in nine countries and 11 cities in Southern Africa. And that was the first time that had really been done. We were very excited by the results and that then led us to ask another range of questions about food systems, informality, uh, and so forth. And we also wanted to expand our work to the global south. So that then resulted in an expansion of the network and the formation of the Hungry Cities Partnership, which is kind of an umbrella for several networks, but also for projects. And so here we are, uh, several years on with the Hungry Cities Partnership, expanded yet again, and uh, we have a new project, and that is my food. So I'm going to ask Jonathan and Jen Jong C to tell us a bit more about that project and take a deep dive into what it is all about. So thank you. Thanks, Bruce. Um, Chen Zhong and I are going to provide you with a uh, really condensed overview of the MyFood uh, project. Um, I'm doing so in my capacity as principal investigator and uh, Chen Zhong is the project manager. Um, the full uh, project title is South-South Migration and Migrant Food Security, Interactions, Impacts and Interventions. And it's a uh, seven year project to run to 2028. And it falls under the general umbrella of pre existing uh, partnership, the Hungry Cities Partnership. And there's a, a link there for those who are uh, interested. Uh, and the project uh, is funded by uh, 2.5 million Canadian partnership grant from the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, or uh, SHERP. Sure to whom I thanks, and uh, over $5 million in contributions from our MyFood uh, partners. Next slide, please. The MyFood team uh, constitutes uh, 22 different partner institutions and over 90 uh, researchers. The main organizations in Canada are, as you've heard, Laurier and University of Waterloo, and Walsilly School, uh, but also the University of the Fraser Valley in British Columbia. We also have um, participants, individual academics from five other uh, Canadian universities. In Africa, University of Western Cape, uh, University of Namibia, uh, Eduardo Montlane in uh, Maputo, University of Ghana, and University of Nairobi in Latin America and Caribbean, University of the West Indies, uh, UAM in Mexico City, and USFQ in Quito, Ecuador. Uh, in the Gulf and Asia, HBKU University, the International Institute of Migration Development in India, Nanjing University, 
and National University of Singapore. And uh, very exciting, we're linked also with a number of international networks and organizations, including International Food Policy Research Institute, uh, Sustainable Development Solutions Network, MIDEC, uh, and three UN organizations, the IOM, the FAO, and the ILO. Next slide. The, the, the project is really focused on, on drawing together uh, two global research and policy agendas that tend to be uh, fairly discreet and proceed in their own directions. And we want to bring them together in this project, which of course is the international migration agenda, on the one hand, the global food security agenda uh, on the other. But with all of the kind of attentions given to uh, South North uh, migration, what tends to get neglected is, a, is actually the more important movement of migrants uh, within the global South, what's come to be called South-South migration. You can see from this graph, uh, this century, South-South migration numerically was more important and has become more important again than South-North in the last decade. So over 100 million um, South-South uh, migrants and this project will also uh, concern itself with internal migration, and there are an estimated uh, 760 million internal migrants in the global south. Uh, next, please. This is just a map from a recent IOM uh, publication showing the distribution of international migrants. Uh, and it is really our focus is on the, uh, at the bottom half. Uh, of this particular uh, map. And as you can see, we have a, a broad distribution trying to cover most of the regions of the global south. Um, next slide. And these are the location of different partner organizations uh, in this project. Uh, the table on the bottom on the right, I won't go into it, but simply to say that all of these countries in which the MyFood will work are both uh, mig migrant uh, origins and destinations for South South Lake migration, but in different uh, ratios in different countries. But when we totted it all up, we found that the uh, total was rather similar, about 18 million uh, migrants in terms of destination and 18 million in terms of origins. Next slide, please. Now, if we turn to the issue of uh, food insecurity, on the other hand, um, International internal migrants are a significant proportion. Nobody knows quite what the proportion is, but a significant portion of the 2 billion global food is secure. Migrants, how many migrants are involved in precarious employment, lack of access to basic rights and services, structural inequality, face uncertain futures, and acute or chronic vulnerability to food insecurity, which has been exacerbated by COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And as this graph uh, from the FAO shows, a uh, sudden increase in 2020, somewhat of a decline in 2021, and a projected increase uh, through the rest of this decade in the number of undernourished uh, individuals. So exceeding 900 million by 2030. So uh, next slide, please. That's really just uh, by way of a very broad brush uh, overview of these uh, two different uh, processes that we want to bring together in this project. So I'll hand over now to my colleague, uh, Jen Jong, to walk you through some of the uh, goals, objectives of the MyFood project. Over to you, Jen. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, so I will use the last few minutes to go over the goal, objectives, contributions, and also some of the research activities of MyFood. Um, the overall goal of MyFood is to design and implement a new and innovative high-impact global research and knowledge mobilization agenda focused on the neglected interactions between migration and food security within the global south. Um, it answers some important questions such as is migration a response to food insecurity 
um, does migration lead to better food security and um, related outcomes for migrant populations and migrant sending um, communities as well? If not, what evidence-based um, um, interventions and practices might uh, help to mitigate um, migrant food insecurity? Next slide, please. Um, the objectives of um, My Food uh, addresses all five shared inside program objectives. Um, so, in particular, um, the objectives of My Food include seven uh, of them, including um, revealing the links between South South migration, rapid urbanization, and food insecurity, examining the different drivers, dimensions, and vulnerabilities of internal and international migrants to food insecurity, um, providing insights into the food insecurity susceptibility of migrants in bilateral and multilateral South-South migration corridors, um, and showing how the transformation of urban food system is generating new forms of migration and precarious employment in the, food sec in the informal food sector for migrants, uh, assessing how migration and food system governance impact on migrant food, in, uh, food security. In addition to these five uh, research objectives, we also aim to build the in institutional capacity of research organizations and networks in Canada and across the South to conduct um, collaborative policy-oriented research and also train a new generation of scholars in Canada and uh, partner countries. Next slide. Um, my food will make a major contribution to knowledge in several interrelated fields. Um, so here I want to highlight uh, five of these major contributions. First uh, is a project will provide new empirical and conceptual insights into forms of South-South connectivity by contributing to greater understanding of human mobility. Um, the second um, contribution relates to the neglected um, uh, scholarly research on migration within the South itself. As Jonathan uh, mentioned just now, there is a vast literature on migration from the global South to Europe and North America. Um, however, migration within the South itself has been uh, seriously neglected. So the project you know, therefore is, will respond to the recent calls of scholars and international agencies for much more work on the drivers of international and internal South-South migration. Um, third, the project will also inject an important new dimension into the ongoing debate about the relationship between migration and development, um, which is the crucial connections between migration, development, and food security. Um, and the project will contribute to the large body of literature on food security in the global South by focusing on gendered food security experience of vulnerable and neglected mobile populations. Um, last but not least, my food will bridge the knowledge gap between two largely discrete bodies of research by examining South-South migration from a food perspective and examining the global food security from a migration perspective. Um, I also want to quickly mention that my food also uh, will contribute to, not, to the knowledge by experimenting on new, a set of new participatory research approaches in food security and migration studies. Next slide. Throughout the seven years, um, the project will unfold uh, with five major work streams, uh, which we call five Cs. So the work stream one, uh, we call cities, We'll focus on the precarity, precarity, exclusion, and migrant food insecurity in migrant destinations. Uh, work stream number two, we call chains. We'll examine migrants' roles and strategies in the informal sector of transforming urban food supply chains. Uh, work stream number three, uh, corridors. We we'll explore food security challenges facing migrants in migration corridors. And work stream number four, connections. We'll analyze rural urban linkages by looking at out migration and food security in rural communities, uh, the communities that are related to our partner cities. Uh, work stream number five, uh, we call controls. We examine policies and governance that will affect, affect migrants' livelihood and uh, food security. 
uh, next slide. So for more information, uh, please visit our website, uh, hungrycities.net, and also check out uh, the MyFood link on that website. Uh, you're also welcome to follow us on Twitter, Moving on Empty, and uh, like our Facebook page, uh, which is also called Moving on Empty. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jen Zhong. So at this point, I will uh, hand over to Jenna Hennebry, my colleague, who is going to introduce our distinguished panel of experts. Thanks, Jenna. Thanks so much, Jonathan and, and colleagues. It's so nice to see everyone. Um, you know, I was thinking about the fact that this time in, it was just this time of year in 2018 that uh, member states were all converging and uh, civil society was converging in Marrakesh uh, to sign the Global Compact for Migration. Um, and I, in preparation for this morning, I thought I would just quickly remind uh, myself and, and, and all of us about the, that important um, moment, but also that really it's in the Global Compact Compact for migration. There's really only two uh, two moments that food security is even even addressed, and it's around drivers of migration. And it's around thinking about you know food in the context of of detention, and I think. Um, that moment is really important for us. And I think that what this is telling us is that this project, the My Food Project is so vitally important at this point in time when uh, you know, the, the recognition of food security as part of migration is only just uh, begun at the international level. Um, thinking of it as drivers is one thing, but thinking about you know, people's food security on the move, right? Uh, people need food while moving in all stages of migration. And um, that this process and, and securing food is a gendered and racialized process. And it has une un uneven outcomes um, where uh, women uh, in particular and other marginalized groups have real challenges in accessing food security. Um, but they play a really key role uh, in, um, you know, the informal economy and hair economy and so many other ways. And so there's so much work to to be done on trying to, to, to understand the complexities of the way in which food and migration link together and the way in, in which uh, gender and other factors um, uh, intervene uh, throughout that process. So this is but one example of the ways that I think this project is so vital um, to, to moving forward towards the 2030 agenda um, around really thinking about adding complexity and, and evidence base uh, to the food migration nexus. So with that as backdrop, I want to introduce some exceptional speakers um, that are representing not only um, different ways of thinking and approaching the issues, but different sort of uh, policy mains, uh, domains and, and uh, organizations that, that might um, think through from different perspectives this very challenging issue and bring their um, ex expertise um, uh, to, um, to addressing um, the challenges in front of us. So I'll start uh, by introducing uh, Mary Ruel, uh, who's director or has been director of the International Food Policy Research Institute um, since 2004. Uh, Dr. Ruel has worked uh, for more than 25 years on policies and programs to alleviate poverty, food insecurity, and malnutrition in developing countries. She has led the multi-country uh, multi program on challenges to urban food and nutrition and the global regional project on diet quality and diet changes for the poor. Really looking forward to hearing your comments. I will give you the floor. You have, you know, roughly five minutes. Go ahead. Sorry, I was muted, right? Okay, uh, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's a real pleasure for me to be part of this launch. I, I uh, very much look forward to working on, on the topic and, and with the great partner network. Um, so I will focus my remarks on the topic of rural to urban migration in the global south and provide a few examples of the complexity of studying and understanding the overall impacts of migration on the migrants themselves and on their home family. I will emphasize that in spite of this complexity, we really do need more data and evidence to inform policy and to identify ways for governments to integrate migrants into their urban economies and support their livelihoods, food security, and well being in the new environment, in their new environment. And I go beyond food security uh, in, in a little bit because I think that 
uh, it's important to emphasize the quality of diet of people. Food security is sometimes defined as uh, calories or the amount of food that people uh, have access to. But I want to make sure that we also talk about the quality of the diets, which is very important for health. Um, so first, I'll report on a few recent case studies that IFPRI conducted with partners that looked at the impacts of migration on the migrants' income, livelihoods, and well-being. So for example, in Tanzania and Ethiopia, we have studies that use panel data spanning over a period of 20 years for Tanzania and five years for Ethiopia. And some of the key highlights are, first of all, that in both countries, the studies showed that overall income of migrants was higher than for non-migrants, talking about those who, who um, were from the same communities but did not migrate, even when taking into account the support that they provide to their family in home villages. In Ethiopia, the study, which was done by uh, Alan DeBrow and, and Hervonen, also found that migrants saw improvement in the quality of their diets compared to the diet of non-migrants, mostly by increasing the consumption of animal source foods. And we know that animal source foods are important. Uh, they provide essential protein and micronutrients, and so they are an, an important component of a healthy diet. So this is a good positive outcome. The Ethiopia study also found larger gains for men migrants compared to women and for migrants who had been in their urban location for longer periods, which is not too surprising. The benefits accrued over time as, migrant, as migrants found jobs, adapted to their new environment and settled uh, in their new life. On the other hand, other studies from our team uh, when looking at other types of indicators such as quality of life and sense of well-being, uh, find a less rosy picture. A study, for example, uh, in Senegal of the horticulture sector showed that migrants tended to earn higher wage than local workers by using a decent but, but by using a decent work index, they showed that migrants had lower job quality. Uh, they worked long hours, they worked at nights, and they worked on weekends. So uh, although, again, they had higher wages, their quality of life was, was lower. Um, similarly, a study in Pakistan showed that despite having 35 to 40 percent increases in income, migrants experience a deterioration in subjective well-being compared to non-migrants. Migrants were less likely to report being happy, calm, in excellent health, or, uh, or and were more likely to report recent illnesses. Uh, finally, in Haiti, another study of well-being that looked specifically at the diet quality among uh, rural to urban youth migrants showed that migrants consumed more ultra-processed foods, including high sugar beverages and unhealthy food snacks compared to their peers in rural areas. Um, this finding confirms that moving to urban areas, although it may have some positive effects on diversity of diets, as suggested in Ethiopia, may also lead to unhealthy shifts in dietary patterns that are concerning uh, because uh, consumption of, of uh, ultra-processed food and, and, and fast food is associated with uh, much increased risks of, of overweight and obesity and non-communicable diseases, and it's not consistent with healthy diet. So I chose those examples to highlight the complexity of analyzing and understanding the specific conditions of migrants which depend on a host of factors, as you all know, that relate to why they migrated in the first place, where they went, how long they have been in their new environment, and what their personal characteristics are, including their gender, age, education, and family situation. But at the same time, the complexity and the dynamics of migration processes mean that we really need to develop a solid research agenda that systematically allows to document those processes across a variety of contexts. We need to develop and use standardized approaches, measurement tools, metrics, and outcome indicators that allow for comparability across the studies. At the same time, we do need the local evidence so that we can engage with national policymakers and other stakeholders and stimulate the development of evidence-based support systems for migrants, especially new migrants, and help them adapt and integrate into their new environment.
So overall, uh, my main message is that uh, there is an urgent need to fill the data gaps when it comes to migration. And this project is, is wonderful in, in attempting and, and aiming to do just that. Uh, we need the data and evidence to create awareness, to inspire and encourage the adoption of policies and initiatives to strengthen the contribution of migrants to national and global economies. And equally important, equally importantly, to support their livelihoods, food security, diet, nutrition, health, and overall well-being. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marie. That was uh, very interesting and um, already starting to get us thinking about all those complexities. Thank you. So I'm going to turn it over now to um, uh, Marie McAuliffe, uh, who is head of the Migration Research Division at the International Organization for Migration, uh, headquarters in Geneva. She's editor of the IOM's uh, flagship World Migration Report, which I'm sure some of you have seen uh, being uh, circulated in, uh, after its exciting release. Uh, again uh, this year. Um, she is an international migration specialist with more than 20 years of experience in migration, practitioner, program manager, senior official, and researcher. Um, she has researched, published, and edited widely in academic and policy series on migration. I can say she's exceptionally great to work with and uh, has uh, such insight, and I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, from you, Marie. So I'll turn over the floor to you. Go ahead. Thanks so much, Jenna. So, such a lovely welcome. Um, uh, very, very nice introduction. I really appreciate it. And uh, yes, um, we have collaborated and, and, and will continue to collaborate. We are, of course, um, on a range of different research projects going forward. And it's delight to be here. Um, it's the reason I look so tired is we have just launched, as Jenna mentioned, the World Migration Report. So it's been a pretty busy time. Uh, and we look forward to working with people all over the world again on the next one, which is starting uh, next month's preparations for that. But in the meantime, um, thank you again for the introduction and also to Jonathan and to Zheng Zhong for the invitation and opportunity to be, to be on the panel today and, and also to be associated with this, this excellent initiative and you know, really hats off and congratulations again in, in terms of the success of the funding round, which is really um, great to see, very, very timely. What I really wanted to, just take a few minutes uh, to talk about is zooming out a little bit and, and looking at the global picture and looking at kind of the links between migration and food security in relationship to displacement um, as well. So looking across that sort of spectrum. We know, for example, that understanding the links between migration, displacement and food security have long been very important. And there's been many years of research as well as policy dialogues, especially at the global level, um, exploring these issues in a variety of ways, most especially, of course, through the framing of migration and development. The Sustainable Development Goals, you know, agreed less than a year ago and with targets that are due to be met in also less than a decade, sorry, a decade ago, uh, also less than a decade from now. Um, they involve commitments that are designed to end hunger to end food security and all forms of malnutrition by 2030. But as we also know, and as highlighted by the FAO's recent report uh, on the state of food security and nutrition in the world, the world has not really been progressing well, either towards ensuring access to safe, nutritious and sufficient food for all people all year round, SDG target 2.1, or eradicating all forms of malnutrition, which is uh, target 2.2. And according to the FAO's uh, recent analysis, conflict, climate variability in extremes, economic slowdowns and downturns are of course major drivers impeding progress on these food security uh, SDG targets. It also stresses that COVID-19 of course is making the pathway towards SDG 2 even steeper. So much so that in 2020, um, FAO estimated that between 720 and 811 million people faced hunger directly and that that number of people in the world affected by hunger has increased due to the impacts of COVID-19. So in 2019, for example, the number was for, uh, 690 million uh, facing direct hunger. Similarly, we're seeing conflict and violence. We're seeing disaster events such as hurricanes, floods and wildfires 
and slow impacts of climate change, as well as economic downturns and growing inequality, also increasingly underpinning human mobility. Now, human mobility, what are we talking about when we say human mobility? We know that human mobility can span the displacement migration spectrum, involving a wide range of mobilities, such as acute mass displacement events, through to the use of migration as a long-term adaptation and coping strategy in the face of ongoing significant transformations, whether they're related to technology or geopolitics or environmental impacts. Conflict, hunger, migration and displacement can be very closely intertwined. And although precise figures may be incomplete, it's estimated that around 80% of populations displaced by conflict within countries or across borders are located in countries affected by acute food insecurity and malnutrition. A recent study by the World Food Programme found that insecurity is a critical driver in international migration, interacting with other well-established migration drivers such as economic opportunity or lack thereof, uh, demographic change and population growth, as well as transnational social and economic networks. At the same time, food insecurity can be an outcome of migration. A significant numbers of migrants find themselves concerned about not being able to meet their food needs along their migration route, particularly when transiting. This issue, of course, has been heightened more recently in the context of COVID-19 mobility restrictions. And last year, IOM, together with the World Food Programme, conducted a joint study that specifically looked at the implications of COVID-19 on migration and displacement in the context of food security, just as the pandemic was really unfolding. Some of the key findings from that 2020 study included that income loss and unemployment pushed many migrants to return home, particularly those who were unable to support themselves in destination countries, you know, seriously impacting migrants and their families, especially those in origin who rely on uh, international remittances for food and shelter, for example. We also found that return journeys thwarted by COVID-19 border closures and travel bans left nearly 3 million people stranded in the early part of the pandemic. Uh, many migrants unable to return to their places of work or return to their communities or countries of origin. We also found that migrant workers in the informal sector were those who were worst hit by COVID-19, profoundly impacted by mobility restrictions such as lockdowns, but also affected by job loss and typically excluded from social protection systems. And we know current estimates indicate that low and middle income countries, 75% of migrant women and 70% of migrant men work in the informal economy. Uneven international remittance impacts caused increased poverty in some locations, while in other locations we saw formal uh, remittances reach record highs. The lack of understanding, however, of the scale of informal remittances prior to the pandemic make it particularly difficult to assess net impacts at the global level. Although they do point to the digitalization of remittances, which of course occurred, especially during the early stages of COVID-19, out of urgent necessity. And that, of course, brings us to the issue of the digital divide, which can impede on uh, international remittances and therefore hamper uh, food insecurity cycles. The study also found that food insecurity increased among displaced populations in countries such as Syria, Lebanon and Yemen. We know that COVID-19 impacts and implications uh, on migration and mobility highlight that while the issue of food security has always been important, it's unfortunately becoming a more prominent issue as communities and countries are increasingly affected by deepening inequalities brought about by the pandemic. We're really looking forward to watching uh, this important research project and partnership develop and evolve, being part of that story. And while we're conscious of the need not to get caught up in COVID-19 and engage in COVIDization of research and analysis and various initiatives, we also do need to recognise that COVID-19 is continuing to impact migration and mobility in different ways around the world. And this is where my food will be particularly important over the next uh, seven years. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marie. 
I'm going to directly go uh, to our next speaker, and we will have a chance to engage with each of these really insightful comments uh, in a few minutes. Um, and uh, but for now, I'll turn it over to Isaac Lugana, who is a professor uh, and Canada Research Chair uh, in the Department of Geography and Environmental sorry, geography and environment uh, in Western, uh, Western University in Canada. Um, he has a broad area of research interest, uh, which include environment and health, population health, GIS applications and health. And his work involves um, an integrative understanding of the broad determinants of the population health um, and the evidence of environment and health linkages. So bringing yet another uh, perspective uh, to the table and, and I'll turn it over to you now and look forward to hearing your comments, Isaac. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Jenna, and uh, thank you, Jonathan, and Jenna for also bringing me on board. And I would also like to thank Marie and Marie for their earlier comments, some of which probably alludes to some of the things I was also planning to talk about. But my main comments are actually related to uh, Webstream 4 on the connections uh, in the proposal, and that is focused on the rural urban linkages, particularly on issues of remittance. Um, the, how food and cash transfers impact food security in the global south is a, is a growing, growing problem and it's, a, it's quite important. Um, changing remittance dynamics with, uh, in relation to technology, Marie alluded to some of them, uh, some of the questions we probably want to understand some more. In fact, the, one of the things as a migrant myself, the instant pressures on migrants related to uh, the, these new technologies, and of course, COVID is, uh, is one of the areas that uh, has a, a lot of complex questions that we, we can try to understand. Um, uh, if, uh, one of the things is, in those days, we would make arguments that, oh, I don't have anybody going home, therefore I cannot remit. These days, uh, with mobile transfers, the pressure of migrants, especially in the urban areas, is really intense. You have no excuse not to remit. Uh, you can't see you, you, you can't send the money and the economic out of pocket cost to migrants is getting bigger and bigger um, uh, in the case of Ghana some of my examples are going to be from Ghana the government is now all of a sudden imposing um, taxes on the uh, mobile transfers and these poor migrants in urban centers who are literally technically speaking or in the farming areas are relying on these mobile transfers to be able to support their families. And all of a sudden, these are all the out of pocket costs that migrants have to deal with. Yesterday, as I was thinking about today's uh, comments, I called Ghana to ask them. In Ghana, we have uh, the Brong Ahafu region, we usually call our food basket. It's in the, the, uh, in the middle belt of Ghana. And from there to the north, where I come from, a, a bag of maize in the Brong Ahafu region is 360 Ghana cities which translates into about 60 US dollars. The cost of transporting it to the region, the drivers will charge the cost of a human being. So it's like taking a seat in the bus. So that is 80 Ghana city, which translated to about 18 US dollars. So you have all these migrants in the, in the middle there trying to get food back home. And that extra cost is added to what, if you can't go yourself, you have to pay that money as if you are going, and if you are going yourself, then you have to pay twice as much. And yet the government is imposing more fines on such migrants. So these are all interesting areas of work that what we, we can look into in terms of what are the out of pocket costs, and then, then related to food security to these migrants in these destinations. Then the other issue that we did, uh, some earlier work we did in this particular region relates to the gendered nature of remittance itself. That in most of South, most of the South South, I think that the gendered nature of remittance, for instance, sending food to whose family, the you know, the, the either of the spouse, the husband or the wife, it, it's a it's a complicated area of work as well. And I don't think we've done much work in trying to understand how that gendered nature of um, um, a, a remittance a, in itself is having some important dimension for migrants in some of these destinations. And a little bit on the side, one of the things that I have been talking about and I think is important is the migration food security nexus does not exclude children's education for migrants. Most of the global South, at least in Ghana, the education system is declining so fast 
that most people now rely on some form of private schooling to educate their kids. And we find that migrants in, in their, their, their task of remitting back home, technically, technically most of them are sacrificing so, so much to support their, uh, the, the families back home that their own children education is sacrificed. The other thing is some of them are living in really, really rural areas, at least in the case of Ghana, they are all in farming areas. The schools there are usually so bad and by focusing on remitting back home, they can't get the excess cash to now send their children to good schools. So you, you just see a cycle of some form of poverty uh, surrounded these migrants, at least in the case of Ghana. It's so appalling, actually, when you when you hear the stories. Then it's also related to um, uh, Marie actually uh, picked up on the issues of COVID because uh, COVID has changed the whole dynamic as well. Um, and there are various questions that we could ask in terms of the relative influence of COVID and engagement. Did it draw sympathy or just turn people off? How we how much of the uh, COVID influence my, my remittance in some of these contexts? I, I think these are the comments that I, I wanted to make, and uh, the, I'll listen to my other colleagues. So, Jen, I'm done. Sorry, that elusive mute button, right? Uh, apologies. Yes, yeah, yeah. Was... <laughs> Thank you so much. Um... Okay, so let's uh, continue to move on, and we will hear from uh, our final speaker, uh, Shirin Rai, um, who's professor in the Department of Politics and International Studies uh, in the University of Warwick in Coventry, England. Um, she's the Director of Warwick uh, Interdisciplinary Research Center for International Development. She's written extensively on issues of gender governance and development in gender and political institutions. Really looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Uh, you have the floor, Sharon. Thank you, Jenna. Um, and thanks, of course, to um, Jonathan and uh, Cheng Chung for organizing this and for including me in the panel. And I really enjoyed listening to the previous speakers uh, and learned a lot because I have to say, I feel a bit of an interloper in the migration field. Um, so my work has largely been on um, gender and international political economy. And then when the first COVID wave hit, I think you must all remember the, the coverage that was given to thousands upon thousands of Indian migrants uh, from cities returning to rural areas in, um, in India. And this was done, the lockdown happened very suddenly. Um, people had no idea, they were thrown out of their jobs. The jobs were tied to their accommodation. They were thrown out of their accommodation. There was no uh, uh, government support for travel. And many died um, traveling back to rural areas. So I became interested in uh, issues around food security, security itself and migration as a result of uh, watching all this unfold uh, on the BBC, sitting here in the UK. Um, and what it made me think of was how COVID had disrupted the quote unquote normal migration patterns. Um, and I started to think about what are the consequences of these disruptions in particular for of course, the migrants, um, they are really important, and, but they were visible, but also for those who were invisible, where the migrants were returning to their homes. And we heard very little about in, in the narratives, understandably so, I suppose, but we heard very little about how they were received, what was the impact of their return, um, on the household itself. So the travel restrictions, lockdowns and movement controls sort of that were imposed by states meant that while the migrant workers often faced destitution and danger in the attempt to return home or were unable to return at all, 
this also disrupted the under sort of you know the the household economy uh, but we know very little about that so i've been working with the idea of social reproduction which is really very briefly the reproduction of life itself um, and trying to think through how social reproductive uh, patterns were disrupted by the disruption of migration patterns. So that is what um, uh, my interest in, in my food is really. And also, of course, um, sort of, uh, as we have heard from Isaac, uh, you know, the, the link between rural urban is really strong in the global south and this disruption for me at least underlined also the importance of keeping the rural urban geosites for research sort of keeping them together these two sites are not separate but are often separated um, and what the covid-based disruption showed us was how these connections play out with some very difficult consequences, not only for migrants, but also for their households. And of course, the sites are also national international, as Jonathan said at the start, which is South-South and South-North, because what COVID did was to also disrupt those, so many people in, from the Middle East in India, for example, who had gone to the Middle East as migrants were then asked to um, leave very quickly in their lockdowns. Um, and so the connection was on the one hand, South, well, internal, rural, urban, but also national, international. And I think I'd like to, to think about that. But finally, just to say on COVID, as Marie uh, first mentioned, that we don't want to COVIDize everything, Be but I don't think we need to. COVID is a crisis, and what we can connect with is how do crises disrupt migration flows, but also how do those disrupted migration flows uh, reshape uh, social reproduction within households. So in that context, my second point and second point of interest would be the gendered impact of disruption through COVID. And this is not just about whether more men and, uh, than women are affected by the temporalities of crises, but also how the rhythms of social reproduction are affected, sort of um, what it, in terms of detail. So given the centrality of remittance uh, income, which we have just heard of, to household survival strategies, the pandemic has inevitably and invariably impacted not just on household income, but also long-standing practices of social reproduction, such as how are children looked after? What are the patterns of elder care provisioning? What is the subsistence food production and how did that get disrupted? And other forms of unpaid labor within the household. Also, returning migrants place additional pressures on unpaid uh, household labor. And of course, a loss of remittance income means that this unpaid labor intensifies as household members may be unable to mitigate some forms of social reproduction. For example, paying for care or, or uh, easy access to the market for food, etc. Also, how do you then uh, reverse migration and intensification of social reproduction under stress of loss of income uh, has been seen to increase, for example, domestic violence. Um, there was a wonderful report written by Oxfam India uh, in 2019, that is pre-pandemic, uh, that uh, um, unpaid labor, the in increase in unpaid labor is also connected to increase in domestic violence. So when you have such intensification of, of social and uh, reproductive labor, then what happens? I'm interested in that. So the global pandemic thus, um, I would suggest places, um, it, it places uh, tra translocal households and translocality where costs of labor and social reproduction are spatially distributed under acute duress, thus intensifying the injustices of uneven immobilities and socioeconomic precarity. And I think that my food hopefully would allow me the space um, and 
I really look forward to conversations across all those five um, uh, work packages that were that Chen Chong um, told us about to, to try and understand this. The third and the final thing that I'm interested in is the effect of crises on the governance of migration. Now, um, I can't remember exactly what the WP5 uh, control, yes. <laughs> and uh, what we have seen is also that the crisis of food of, of COVID has been used by states to push through legislation to surveil populations and opposition and to generate nationalist populism that militates against migrants. So what we need to research is how the gender governance of migration might be improved such that the deep inequalities of income and status are mitigated through state intervention, market regulation, especially during times of crisis. So those are the three areas that I'm interested in uh, examining together with colleagues on my food. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sharon. That's, um... Uh, I think uh, a really uh, interesting uh, set of, uh, of insights to end on in terms of our discussion, or maybe not end on, to lead us into more discussion. Uh, certainly, I think thinking about the, the role of um, just sort of thinking about the care economy and then, and the informal economy and how this uh, is, is all connected in is, is really key. Um, certainly, it's some, an area that I'm interested in. So, um, But I will uh, ask now for people to indicate if they would like to uh, weigh in, if they have questions or comments, um, I'd uh, encourage you to use the chat. Uh, let me know if you, you have a question uh, of any kind uh, and uh, or a comment, and now you'll have a, a few minutes um, uh, to, uh, to engage with our panelists. Um, any thoughts? Um, you can also raise your hand if that's, you know, needed. For some reason, I don't see you. Um, <laughs> Uh, do we have any questions? We've, we're hearing positive impact, uh, things in the chat. People are saying um, good things about us and about what we're trying to do here. So that's good. But, uh, but I was wondering if people had any particular questions. If not, I will, I will lead off with a question. Okay, then I will lead off with a question and see if anyone has any. We only have a few more minutes for discussion. Uh, and uh, But I definitely, I'm really interested in this, um, uh, like a reflection from, you know, possibly from from yourself and from from Isaac about, uh, Sharon and Isaac in particular around the informal economy. Um, and thinking about the way in which uh, food security is, um, is, is tied into the informal economy and, and how, um, you know, and certainly lessons learned from, from COVID help us here, but also just sort of moving forward in terms of what are the areas we need to be uh, investigating uh, and thinking through, and, and how do we move forward with um, with uh, with addressing those uh, with reference to the informal economy? I wondered if either of you had any thoughts or reflections. Maybe I'll go Isaac and then Sharon. Yeah. So so it is true that in most of the global south, the migrants literally find themselves in the informal economy. Most of them, right? Especially if, right when they are still starting to in these new destinations, there's no way you can survive without jumping into it. And especially with COVID, when things were closing down in some of the, at least in the cases of Ghana and the rest, they, they, they are always the first, the first, first line of people to get nailed they, in, in the sense of losing their informal jobs and their informal networks and not be able to send remit at home to, to people at home. So those are the, the, the key challenges that I think the, the given that that's where they start, most of them start really right there. So it's, it's uh, depending on it, how you read the question by period. But I think that, that uh, those are some of the issues that I, I will be interested in. Yeah. I think, Jenna, to go, to go to your question about informality, I mean, I think that uh, one of the issues that I would be interested in looking at is how does the informality of employment in urban areas affect the precarity of the economy in, in the households in the rural areas? So what is the connection between sort of, you know, informality and informal 
economies which are so much less regulated in uh, the global south and yet which absorb so much labor. Uh, and so the precariousness and what we found in India was how that precariousness meant that, you know, this, this sort of migration, which was absolutely a flow of people, uh, was really to do with, with the way in which informal economies are unregulated or not unregulated, but they're not as well regulated, which means, which has all kinds of consequences for, for those involved. And then the second thing in terms of informal economy is how do we define informal economy? So is the unpaid economy of the household, is that informal economy or not? And if that isn't, then and how does that connect with sort of, you know, the production for the household, not by the household? So some of those big meta questions which economists kind of pose but take for granted, if you start unpacking them through these uh, projects, then I think it would be really interesting for us. Yeah, I think I think that's a, that's bang on for sure. Um, also, I, I had another question, but the, Jonathan also um, uh, sent sent a similar question to me in in the text, and so I wanted to direct it towards Marie, uh, if possible. Um, I was thinking about sort of the international domain and how you know while there has been attention to this, I to this issue, I find it still pretty siloed in terms of the approaches, and wondered um, you know why, if you've had thoughts on on why migration and food security do seem to be in such separate domains at the international level. Um, I have seen in the Global Forum on Migration Development that there has been some bridge making in this in this regard, but it still seems to be separated out. And then the other area that I see is that there's a, a, a tendency to emphasize agriculture, right? Um, and I'm not entirely sure how to how those are being bridged. I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on that. And I know Jonathan would as well. Well, I mean, from a from a governance perspective, as opposed to perhaps from a research perspective, um, uh, within that context, you've got to, I think, look at the SDGs in the context of the global compacts for safe, orderly, regular migration and the global compacts on refugees. So they're they're separated out. We've got, I mean, if anybody wants to have a look at <laughs> the global governance chapters that were have been produced. Uh, in the last couple of uh, World Migration Reports. We've got one great one by um, Susan Martin and then uh, Kathleen Newland helped us uh, with the 2020 edition, really looking at the different processes at the global level in regards to the GCM, the GCR, and also the setup of the UN uh, Network on Migration, for example. Um, the big one that we normally get asked, because it's not usually around issues to do with um, food insecurity, which is acknowledged in you know, the academic long-term academic research, um, as well as in policy dialogues as being one of the drivers. So one of the contributing drivers to migration, that's typically how it's framed. And then the migration and development angle around you know, supporting poverty alleviation. So those are the two, kind of like the two big kind of key issues, so to speak, to do with um, migration. Uh, one of the big uh, issues is really about um, internal displacement and where does internal displacement fit in within the context of the global governance arrangements and of course that's where the high level panel on on internally displaced persons um, has recently reported and is helping to sort of fill that gap but as I highlighted in, in um, my short intervention the work that we've been doing for a number of years now in the most recent report with the World um, Food Program, but also uh, collaborating with FAO as well in the past, is that a lot of these issues around food insecurity underpin not just um, migration, but they underpin internal displacement as well as cross-border displacement. They are very much connected in terms of um, why people are moving and what sort of risks and vulnerabilities they're facing when they are moving. So I think there's, uh, I mean, it's fantastic timing. I think it, it's quite by chance in many respects, but we don't want to, again, uh, really focus just on COVID, but COVID has been such a significant game changer. It has brought some of these issues to the fore and the connections between sort of food insecurity and underpinning that spectrum of migration and displacement, both internal and cross-border. I think the timing is very good to be able to get uh, this particular issue elevated within the international community um, so that it can be uh, looked at 
across that broader spectrum, not just looking at um, you know, international migration within a narrow kind of framing that we do have to look at um, uh, migrants in a range of different settings. So I think this is, you know, it's a big challenge, but I think the timing is really good uh, for this particular initiative, this partnership and this program. Thanks. Yeah, I think um, I think that's pretty accurate assessment. Let's hope so anyway. <laughs> um, so there's one more question in the chat. I'll, I'll take that. We'll we'll have a couple of comments from panelists if they have any, and then and then we'll wrap up. Okay. So the question in the chat is from John Orredo, um, and he has asked. Oh, there's a whole bunch of things that have just popped up in the chat. It's hard to uh, hold it in one spot. Uh, what are the possible dimensions of the digital divide that um, has an effect on migrant food security? Um, I have thoughts on that, um, but I'm sure others do as well. And I'd love to hear um, uh, from, from any of the panelists that might have a thought about uh, the digital divide and how this uh, intersects with this important issue. Anybody? Everyone's in radio silence. Um, I mean, I think there's a number of factors that are key here for us to raise everything from, you know, remittance sending and, and cost of remittances as key to food security uh, for migrants who are, you know, on the move in multiple locations and, and in transit, being able to, to send money home is, is often a, a real challenge. That's one example. Also, you know, access to, to communication technologies to be able to um, to manage their own migration and not have to turn um, to to others uh, uh, to help uh, the process, and and um, some of them might be unscrupulous uh, recruiters. So so there's a lot of um, a lot of areas that I think that that connects up into this, and there's lots that can be talked about. I think in 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 future work. Um, so um, let's just uh, please join me in uh, thanking all of the panelists uh, for their insightful uh, comments and getting us thinking about these important issues um, and uh, and the range of complexities and perspectives that need to come to the fore and, and that I think will be uh, informing this uh, exceptional work as we move forward uh, with all of the work streams and really uh, excited to be part of this project. And so uh, thank you as well for participating, everyone. I'll turn it over uh, in a second and just join me in saying thanks, uh, merci. Shokran, gracias, and thank you to everyone. I'll turn it over now to Jonathan. Uh, thanks uh, very much, uh, Jenna and panelists for fascinating uh, insights into this uh, complex topic. Um, I'm uh, delighted to introduce our final speaker, uh, Professor Daniel Tubera. Uh, if you'd like to join me on the screen. Um, he is uh, both a friend and also extraordinary professor at the University of the Western Cape. Now just allow me a slight uh, introductory digression. Uh, those who follow the uh, brilliant uh, German uh, streaming series on Netflix uh, called Simply Dark, will know that the main characters travel uh, backwards and forwards in time in 33-year uh, cycles with various unintended consequences, including, uh, amongst other things, meeting younger, later versions uh, of themselves. If I travel back, not 33, but 42 years for a moment, uh, to a younger version of myself, uh, I meet uh, Dan uh, for the first time. Uh, when he and I were both graduate students at Queen's University. Uh, Dan looks exactly the same as he did uh, 42 years ago, unlike myself, uh, who clearly uh, is showing the effects of uh, time travel. Uh, Dan uh, has worked with us uh, for many years, first uh, on a couple of projects that Bruce mentioned, on the Southern African Migration Program um, when he was at uh, University of uh, Zimbabwe. And, and SAMP is actually now housed at the University of Western Cape. Um, also on uh, the African Food Security Network, 
when uh, he was at the uh, University of uh, Eswatini. And now, uh, delighted to, to welcome him and, and our colleagues at uh, the University of the Western Cape uh, as our South African partners on the My Food Project. And UWC is a great um, institution, but also uh, a center of excellence for both food and migration studies in South Africa and Africa more broadly. So we're very delighted to uh, have uh, Dan here with us, and he's just going to offer a few concluding uh, reflections uh, on uh, the project and on what he's heard uh, today. So thanks, uh, Dan, over to you back in the 1970s. Thank you, Jonathan. My task today is quite simple, and it is to do the closing. The session has been very interesting, so uh, it makes my task even a lot easier. I would like to do so by underlining what makes my food project a significant contribution to the two fields of migration and food studies. First, the project addresses various interrelated gaps in knowledge the so-called liminal spaces that appear when South-South migration is examined from a food perspective and when global food security is examined from a migration perspective. Jenna has talked very briefly about the silos. Uh, there is need to unbundle the existing silos, uh, especially uh, regarding migration studies and food studies. And from what we have heard this afternoon, uh, there is a deliberate attempt to, uh, to do so by uh, addressing the several intersectional issues between migration and food. However, this will require novel ways of visualizing and imagining how to study these inter intersections or interactions within these overlapping migration and food spaces at the local, national, and regional levels. Zhen Zhong's presentation is focused on uh, the methodological approaches and it is quite evident uh, from what he has said that uh, uh, ways of addressing these intersections have been clearly thought about. And the second point, um, is that this project, uh, you know, it attempts an epistemic or epistem uh, epistemic positioning of the project. Um, it's quite unique the way it has been constructed and developed. It aims to promote a very clear South-South dialogue on migration and food. I think this is very important, uh, especially from the point of view of uh, generating uh, this body of knowledge from the global South. Uh, another very impressive uh, issue regarding uh, the research teams is the vast geographic reach. There are 12 different countries across several continents um, in the global south, and of course, Canada uh, is there to play a role. And these studies will focus on the interactions between south-south migration, uh, which is quite significant, and also food insecurity. 
which define the daily experience of millions of migrants in the global south. It will bring south-south migration and food security together in a framework we have been told that addresses the systemic development challenges with relevant to several SDGs. And finally, congratulations to Jonathan Crush for pulling together this massive project. Uh, we had uh, various discussions about this project um, at different levels and it was just difficult to imagine how this thing could come together the way it has emerged. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dan, for those uh, concluding remarks. It is, of course, something of an irony of the uh, COVID pandemic that we are now so used to Zoom that we can actually hold uh, this kind of uh, event and um, bridge the so-called uh, digital uh, divide. Uh, and of course, going forward, this will help us greatly in, in, in the challenge, as you rightly point out, of bringing uh, this rather ambitious uh, project and the many partners and researchers uh, together. But at the same time, we all know that in the end, face-to-face uh, -face, uh, contact, uh, socializing um, is, is vital to uh, building of a really strong and robust uh, partnership of this character. And so uh, we, we, we kind of follow the numbers every day and we hope that it won't be too long before everyone uh, can get together uh, in, uh, in person uh, for a meeting. So uh, thanks to everybody for attending this, for the excellent uh, presentations. Uh, thanks uh, particularly uh, from behind the scenes to Joanne uh, Weston and Maria uh, Salomoni. And uh, finally, uh, Thanks to all of our partner institutions for their support of this project and, and cash and in kind uh, contributions. And finally, to the Social Science and Humanities Research Council of Canada, who have given us a good platform uh, for funding the initial stages of what we hope will be uh, an organically growing uh, network, which will attract uh, lots of additional uh, support from different agencies. Thank you very much. Uh, at this point, um, we will uh, draw the proceedings uh, to a close. This uh, particular um, event uh, has been recorded and will be uh, posted on the uh, My Food Hungry Cities Partnership uh, website uh, for those who'd like to think some more about the um, project uh, and the issues that have been raised. So thanks uh, so much. Thank you, Dan, and thank you, everybody. We'll see you soon. Bye, thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.